Right now, the AFL Commission is meeting in Sydney and we can reveal the AFL and the AFL Players Association and other stakeholders are already discussing a revamp of the illicit drug code. The AFL is moving to a philosophy that whilst illicit substance are a societal problem, players are getting paid plenty of money to be professional. If you want to play football, don't take drugs. You want to hide these documents. If there are no illegal drugs in the player's system, they are free to play. And if there are drugs in their system, the, the player is often asked to fake an injury. They're advised to lie about their condition, while the results of the off-the-book tests are kept secret and never shared with Sports Integrity Australia or WADA. I noted that the term white line fever has taken on a different and sinister meaning at the AFL. I, I can't believe how angry I've got uh, just hearing the news. This is almost on the same level as the Essendon site. In fact, not even get beyond that. We understand the illicit drug policy can be improved, and we are working with the AFLPA and our players to improve the policy to ensure we are better able to change the behaviour of players. But we are unapologetic about club and AFL doctors taking the correct steps to ensure that any player who they believe has an illicit substance in their system does not take place in any AFL match. I think every person in Clubland would want answers and want understanding of how the policy works and is it a success? Yeah, we've been through a bit, but as I said, this is an AFL policy. We'll be asking the appropriate questions and getting the answers that we need. Hello everyone, welcome to Footy Classified. What a big week it has been in football. We'll try and get through all of it tonight here on Footy Classified. Matthew Lloyd, Damien Barrett, Jimmy Bartell. Welcome guys. First of all, uh, Damien, uh, an excellent story by Michael Warner and the Herald Sun today. For me though, the story was the enmity between the club doctor at Melbourne and the president of Melbourne and what was left. There wasn't a whole lot of new news as far as what's been going with the drug code, but maybe new to people who don't know what really goes. Yeah, there's a Glenn Bartlett layer to that, Ed, and he being the former chairperson of the club, president of the club, who was taking action against several people. It's a 20-year story, Ed. This illicit drugs policy is in its 20th season of operation. It was controversial from its inception. It has served a purpose to a point for the AFL, but it is littered with flaws and it has been rorted. And as you reported earlier this month, it is officially done. Yeah, and I can tell you, the first time I went to a president's meeting in 1998, I brought up illicit drugs and the other presidents in the commission had no idea about it. So that was 1998, we got to 2005, the drug code came in. Why did the drug code come in? Because the Players Association and the AFL realised it was getting out of hand. Why did that story that we dropped three weeks ago come? Because, again, the Players Association, the players who don't do drugs, the clubs and the AFL say it is all getting out of hand again. And so now what they're saying is we don't need, we, we, we want to be empathetic to anyone who's got mental health issues, but don't take the mickey. And now it's too dangerous for everyone, for the players themselves, for long-term bans, for the clubs, nefarious activities, blackmail opportunities, all these things, as well as you know, what we're seeing now, everyone's in court every five minutes, as well as long term down the road, enough's enough. They are going to bring in a punitive code. They're going to say that the AFL is not on match day, the testing, but match day is the entire season. That's the biggest jump that is coming. I believe that this will be done by June this year, and I think it'll come in next year. Mm. They'll kick it around. They'll have to get everybody signed off on it. But there's far less sense of humour. So, so a streamlining of just the one policy, as you reported yeah. four weeks ago, yeah. of, of no illicit drugs policy, just the uh, Sports Integrity Australia code. This is they'll, the... they'll run it in parallel, though, Damien. They're going to have, they'll still have what was WADA, so Sports Integrity Australia, doing the match day testing for everything, including performance enhancing. Yep. But they'll also add, so this will actually be the strongest drug code probably in sport. And this is the AFL's re response today, and it's backed its policy, it always has backed its policy, it backed it from day one when media were asking questions back in 2005 about its uh, its establishment. Um, this is why they wanted it to bring it in, the medical model attached yeah. to it, Lordo, and let's wade down that path of it right now. There's a lot of layers to it, we'll get to all of them in the next few moments, but the medical yeah. model aspect of it. Yeah, what shocked everyone today, including me, was there's a lot of rumours in your innuendo around players over the past few years saying, is their injury genuine? But you, you took it on face value that, that it was. But I want to ask you as a president, Ed, and you as a director of footy, Jimmy, were you ever aware that players were not going to be playing because you know, an injury might have been mentioned, but there was more to it than that? No, Lloyd, in, in my time of being a director at the Giants, I have no idea. 
I don't have no idea who's got strikes. I have no idea what a play, if you're brought into the club, whether they're bringing a strike with them. You're completely in the dark. And Simon Goodwin touched on that. We're just asking the AFL for answers because it is their policy. Can I say, though, Jimmy, as a player, you wouldn't, wouldn't want anyone to know what was going on in your private medical world. Well, you weren't no, allowed. No, no. You, you weren't allowed. You weren't and allowed. You... That's, that's the thing. The doctors aren't hiding. Hmm. Their first priority is doctor-patient confidentiality. The AFL made it actually prohibitive to find out. Mm. Now, as a president, I think we, let's roll this. A, a grab here from Nathan Buckley today, which, you know, my eyes bugged out on. I had a doctor come to me once early in my coaching career and say that a couple of players had done their hamstrings during the, during the session and wouldn't be available for four weeks, standard. But they'd, they'd trained and got through the session. So I, I wonder in retrospect whether there was a strike there that I wasn't mm. aware of. Hmm. So I didn't know about that, but I can tell you, I went, I went and asked doctors who couldn't ask, and I was probably out of line on the, on the situation. But if I'm getting phone calls from nightclub owners, cops, supporters, everybody else, and I'm seeing situations, you know, as, as a, an observer of football hmm. for a long time, you know, you want to be in there. That's why Jeff Kennett, myself, and a few other presidents really wanted to know what was going on. Not just the doctor, but to be in charge of the club. We had fiduciary duties as directors, and we weren't allowed to find out. Now, there were, there were other clubs, though, in President's meeting who said, we don't want to know anything about yeah. it. It's the AFL's play. We, don't, we can't solve a society issue like drugs. Who can? Parents don't know what's going on in the next bedroom for less football clubs. We shouldn't be held up to this situation. So Melbourne today come in saying it's got nothing to do with them and everything with the AFL is 100% right. Yeah. Damo, there'll be a huge uh, proportion uh, of the public who'd be thinking the AFL is complicit in this as far as helping them, uh, helping the players mm. avoid water on, on the weekend and also this is just a brand management at its best. Yeah, look I understand that argument Jimmy. I, I pushed back hard on the AFL in 2005, Bobby, till 2020 on that aspect of it. I have got my head around the medical model aspect of it and, and I do appreciate that part of it now, that there is a need for protection of players going through various situations that we don't know about. Now, the number in question when you talk about the, the harbouring or want of a better word in this situation situation. We're dealing with a number that's less than 20. It might be about a dozen every single year on average, Lord, that, that are, are the, the number of players required to be taken out of the system. I've been long critical of that aspect of it. The three strikes that it was initially became two strikes. Let's face it, it was never there to name that player. And again, I've got my head around that over the journey. But don't say it's a drugs policy. Say it's a drugs code of conduct for, as, a, as a starting point. I mean, the only person ever under the policy to actually reach the, the threshold was Travis Tuck. And the third strike under that regime was a police involvement in that matter, not an AFL yeah. issue. I don't yeah. think it sets you up for the real world. Um, yeah. you know, I think you're, you're, you're protected so much in an AFL, probably too much in an AFL system. The amount of guys who their lives fall off, the moment they walk out of the footy club, they know, geez, this is the real world here, and you're on your own, and I think it sets you up for failure. So, Eddie, where do we go then? You, you touched yeah. on this weeks ago. First strike... Well, uh, what the, what the, we're, we're nominating six yeah, weeks, six OK? Weeks, now, yeah. it might be four weeks, four, it might yeah. be. But what they want to do is they're going to say, they're going to normalise it, if you like. You know, Lloyd out, hamstring, Joe Blow out, drugs. drugs yeah. And you go and you... But what if the mental health issue is apparent at that moment? Ed? Yeah. I still can't see that being made public. No, but, uh, but the, the problem with that is is now you can... I think people have got over, and we're going to talk about the you know the uh, the concussion situation. Mm. We all have to have the grown-up pants on now. Yeah. So drugs are a problem. Yep. Mental health issues are a problem. Yep. They're not stigmas anymore. You can work through it. Because what well, it has been brought what brings on the mental health. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Is, Some, yeah, yeah, mental health issues. Yeah, 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 but putting half a Columbia up in your beak on a Saturday night. Yeah. Look, Anthony Albanese has been brought into it by Andrew Wilkie's yep. uh, announcement or revelations in Parliament last night. He was asked to look into it uh, and he responded today. Those allegations, I'm not aware of whether they are correct or not. You know, I have uh, a big job. On that job description isn't the control of the Australian Football League. Uh, but uh, if issues are raised, the Sport Integrity Australia uh, is aware of the issue and they have begun their assessment and I'm sure that the member for Clark will forward any documentation to the appropriate body. Look, I think the other thing is the Players Association and the players have had enough as well and I think everyone now understands that sunlight is the best disinfectant and you're better off having it out in the open and 
not have these things every mm. time there's a drug gotcha moment that it's a big story. Big. We know it's part of society, but that doesn't mean there was a simple line on this, and that is it's not compulsory to play football, yeah. but it is compulsory to play football drug free. And, and to that point, and what you just said about it not setting up for life, uh, th this is playing out publicly anyway when the police or the public are involved. And here's some recent examples, and, and we remember the Jack Ginnivan situation, don't we? With the, the the uh, Bailey situation, Bailey Smith situation. Um, there's other names there, and, and these are just a random amount of names. There's two AFLW players from Sydney. Again, there's not actually a drugs policy, a illicit drugs policy in the AFLW, but they were named but in the past 24 hours, rightly because of the police involvement. But this is where it's dangerous. So you get rubbed there for four weeks if somebody takes a photo of you. You get nothing if you self-report. You get four years if you get caught on match day. And so it's all over the place. But the opportunity to blackmail a player by taking a photo of them over the summer... You've been big on that, haven't you? Well, yeah. mate, I don't know. It might be growing mm. up in Broadmeadows. You keep your eye out for all these sorts of things. But the blackmail opportunity, you are dealing with organised crime once you take drugs. Yep. You know, it doesn't matter who your dealer is and all that sort of stuff. You leave yourself wide open. You're wide open to, if you've had a, a fallout with uh, you know, your girlfriend, uh, we've seen all that sort of uh, blackmail that happens. Far less nefarious activities, mm. match fixing, et cetera, et cetera. Far better for a player to get six weeks and have to face mum and dad that they've taken drugs. And deal with it there and, and then. Mm. you yeah. have to face somebody yeah. who's going to cut Because the, the alternative is to, is to not harbour Jimmy. And, and again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but to not... Joel Smith is the exhibit of, of why yeah. the clubs have gone down this path to try and take them out of the system. There's nothing stopping Sports Integrity Australia, Lordo, still testing these yeah. players at this same point in time. Um, the but timeline there, Jimmy. Just, just on that one, you brought up Joel Smith. Yeah, it's alleged that he had uh, messages on his phone yes. of other players. Other players are implicated right? in So that's that. what, as a president, yep. we've been all over from day one. We need to know who needs help or who is a rotten egg mm. and, and find them because we're getting kids in who are 18 years of age coming out of uh, you know, school football. They might be coming from the Perth or the middle of nowhere or up the street. It doesn't make any difference. I like the idea of the concussion passport. But I like the idea of this going into junior levels. I've been pretty strong on this, Matt. You're there because you're a coach. Mm. But I'd like to see the drug testing go into junior football. That may be down as, as low as under 17s. So I just think it gets everybody's mind on that you are going to be tested. And I'll guarantee you, I'll stick my head out here and say that if a player goes out to a nightclub on a Sunday night or a Saturday night and he can say to his friends, his partners, whoever's dealing this stuff, no, I'm going to get tested next week, the, the numbers will fall and, and be named and get four weeks and all that. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's having it over your head. Oh, mate. Yeah. yeah, that's what we need. So the inception, yeah. as, yeah, yeah. as we know, is 2005, and it's no coincidence that West Coast Eagles partying yeah. um, at that particular point in time was a, a large precursor to this. And that's its inception. There's a snapshot there. They initially, the AFL, released the numbers just in, in a totality number. The highest number was in the in the high 20s. Um, there was some as low as so six. That's half your list. The high 20s. That's, yeah, and again, it's it's ran, it's randomly done. Um, with other cases over that particular period in time. This is just highlighting the the, the, the seriousness of it, that the way it has been treated, that updating of the policy in 2015, and pretty much every year since. And, and I just want to raise this too. This was a quote from Brian Rowhead, who, who ran the Sydney Olympics from an Australian um, track and field Brian, perspective. Right? Yeah. And he was working at the AFL at the time. He, he, he can see what he said there. I, I, this is almost four, this is four years after it started. It's a good idea. But the, the exceptions at the Olympic has been totally lost. And he's got more chance of money out of a Nigerian email scam than he has been caught under this policy. No one's been caught and named and shamed under it. The other thing that's come to light in recent times is all these retrospective legal suits and class actions. So the AFL have now realised if you're doing pre-season training and, you know, this is where a lot of the drug issues happen over the off-season where there's no testing, and suddenly you're being exerting, you're in the sunlight, you're hot, you're doing all those sorts of things, something bad can really happen. OK, so they're worried about the players there, but also the repercussions. The other thing that I'm looking with, the, you know, similar to the concussion, is in 10 years' time, if a player has got mental health issues off the back of drugs, remembering these things are mind-altering drugs, so that wouldn't be the first time this happened or their life's fallen apart. And they say, well, you knew that six, seven, eight times I self-reported and all you're worried about was that, you know, I didn't get caught. And I was clear on Thursday, so I played on Saturday. And repeat, repeat, repeat. There's going to be massive ramifications. I'll say it again. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Be open and accountable. Be adult about it. 
we have a domestic competition that doesn't have to answer to Olympics or anybody else. We can fashion the best drug code for punitive action, but most importantly to look after our players and make it attractive for kids to play our game, boys and girls coming through. That should be it. And the rest of it, mm. if you decide to take drugs, well, good luck and let the buyer beware. Will you now question, Damo, a player who has a secondary hamstring? Oh, look, oh, I have. I mean, privately, you have have yeah, and you, yeah. you and I have had discussions so now unfair. the footy world is going to, yeah. so now it's yeah. very much unfair. Yeah, it is. On yeah. the no, whole every world. rested yeah. player has now got, yeah. a, got yeah. a black cloud. And, and, and names already come to mind, yeah. don't they, for yeah, people do. who are being brought in on this part of this story today as to what's happened in relatively yeah. recent times. And yeah, that, that's unfair because not everyone who's got it in And that's why, it, to be honest, Damo, I don't have a worry about players being named now because behind people's hands mm. and in the stands, I mean, the public aren't mugs. Mm. They go out, they know who's doing what and yep. everything else. The parliamentary privilege element of yeah. Andy Wilkie's performance last night, Ed, and, and now the AFL wanting what Anthony Albanese has said, please cough up those documents to Sporting, Sports Integrity Australia. Well, there's privacy attached to that information that he used last night from a, from a medical perspective. Yeah. And whether those documents do find their way to Sports Integrity Australia remains to be seen, but the AFL is actually wanting that to happen as part of that uh, assessment that the SIA will now take. OK, well, as I said, uh, my understanding from senior officials today is they're working towards having something that the framework worked out pretty much by June this year. Won't come in this year, I don't think, but uh, moving on towards it. So I think it's a good thing. If anything, the explosion today has got everyone focused. Yeah. And while we spoke about it three or four weeks ago on this very show, now everyone knows what's happening and they see the danger involved in all of this and it's not worth it to cover up for a few party boys acting the goat. End of story.